Once a year, the city of Jerusalem turns green and yellow. And despite our deep historical ties with the state of Wisconsin and our well-known affinity for cheese, this has nothing to do with the Green Bay Packers. Throughout the city, families build these little booth-like huts that they live in throughout the holiday. They have a citron fruit and a date palm, it's called a lulav and an etrog in Hebrew, that we use to worship God on the holiday of Sukkot. To the untrained eye, the overwhelming sensations on the holiday of Sukkot may be so extreme that they may not notice a very curious phenomenon. The Gentiles. Shalom, Goyim. Shalom to you. Sound and logical. Hi. It's good to see you guys again. Wow. This is different. My first time camping. I'm looking forward to this week. And so you should. This week symbolizes great things to come. Let's go over there. Okay. Let's go. Their entire people was delivered. It's not about a personal revelation, but rather a national revelation. But God redeemed an entire people from Egypt, as he had promised Abraham, going back to Genesis chapter 15. This week symbolizes, and has, meaning for many things. It reminds us of when our forefathers left Egypt and wandered the deserts for 40 years. In the midst of a biblical holiday celebrated exclusively by the Jewish people, today we see as many, if not more, non-Jews making the voyage to Jerusalem to celebrate Sukkot. The last time we saw anything like this representation from all nations of the world was in Solomon's temple over 3,500 years ago. What's interesting is that all these feast days go back to Moses and the Exodus, but if there was no Moses and the Exodus, that's interesting. What's also interesting, there's no evidence for a King Solomon. It shall be that all who are left over, the remnant of the nations who had come to Jerusalem, will go up every year to worship the King Hashem, Master of Legions, and to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. People aren't just coming to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival. There are families all over the world from different backgrounds, different religious affiliations, that are building little huts outside their homes, freaking out their neighbors, all to celebrate the biblical festival of Sukkot. Like all things in Judaism, there are some rules that apply to building a sukkah. Through the Hebrew word sukkah as written in the Torah, we're able to see that a sukkah may have two and a half, three, or preferably four walls. The height of a sukkah cannot exceed 20 cubits, while the width cannot exceed infinity. That's right, a sukkah can be as wide as you want. The laws of building a sukkah reveal the essence of the holiday. A sukkah can be as expansive as possible to include as many people as possible. Because one day the entire world will leave the security of their homes and enter into the ultimate sukkah in Jerusalem. Hope to see you there. Chag Sameach. Happy holidays from Russia. We love. <laughs> Happy holidays from Jerusalem to Mexico. Chag Sameach from South Africa. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Sukkot Sameach. Happy Sukkot. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to rain on anyone's parade, but a lot of these holy days, these holy days, they were actually pagan in gathering cosmological days. From winter solstice to spring, there was a lot of celebrations regarding the earth and the time to gather, the time to replenish, those kind of things. These things and days were taken by monotheism, reappropriated and then demonized the people they had taken and things from. And truthfully, the pagans were just following the natural nature or cycle. The pagans were just following the natural nature or cycle, which was demonized. And then these forms of religion were introduced as the, the genuine, authentic religions. These two festivals, understandably, are marked on the same day of the month, the 15th day of the month. Passover is marked on the 15th day of the first month, 
both of those days, the moon, the moon is full. The miracle is exposed for everyone to see. A national event, a national miracle. Seems on the surface to be, well, the the easiest Jewish holiday to understand along with Passover, after all. Passover well, celebrates, marks the moment that God redeemed the Jewish people from Egypt, from bondage, with great miracles. Sukkot, the festival of tabernacles, celebrates the journey. Oh yeah, and a quick side note. A heathen is a dated term used primarily of someone who's not religious or whose religion is not Judaism, Islam, or especially Christianity. A pagan, a person who is not religious or whose religion is not Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. Paganus. Paganus. The term country dweller. Paganus set the rural population still further apart from the empire's Christianized urban population. Paganus. In ancient Rome, a person living in a rural area or village was called Paganus, a word derived from the Latin noun pagus, meaning village, district. In time, Paganus came to refer to a civilian as opposed to a soldier. Let's go. This week symbolizes, and has, meaning for many things. It reminds us of when our forefathers left Egypt and wandered the deserts for 40 years. It also reminds and prepares us for the tribulation when everyone in this world will be displaced for a time. We of course, hope, and pray, that we will be among the few that are kept safe in the place of safety. Everyone, is the same, here. We are all in the same boat. Although, some here may be wealthier now, than others, when the tribulation kicks in big time money will mean nothing, helping and relying, on others will be what counts. Not just talk and money. So, this week, helps us, all to live, to an extent, the same way as Moses and our people, did for forty years. Everyone helps to set up camp, and dismantle the camp, when it's over. We all work together to keep the camp clean, cook, eat and fellowship together. Wow! Sounds like a really good way to form close bonds with other people. Exactly! Just like Moses and our forefathers had to do, to survive in the wilderness. The only times they suffered really was when they became divided. I think I am going to like this week very much. I know people that keep the Feast of Tabernacles. But I was told that some stay in hotels. Others stay in trailer parks, or other cheap accommodation, depending on what they can afford. That is true. Most churches that keep tabernacles will do exactly that. But how can they get a sense of what our forefathers went through? How can you form, true bonds with people, if the wealthy have it good, and others rough it? I prefer what we are doing here. Any time. But that's me. If you want to do what others do, it's up to you. No thanks. We like it here. We want to know our brethren not just play at it. Good. Let's talk more now, about the Feast of Tabernacles. This stage of Yahweh's plan, also represents the millennial reign of Yahshua, as King of Kings. Those that survive the tribulation will be taught the ways of Yahweh. Under the leadership of Christ and the resurrected saints with Satan out of the way. Progress will be swift, as all nations and people will see the benefits of turning to, Yahweh, and will finally work together, Yahweh commanded us to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in Leviticus 23 34. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days to the Lord. We are to live for seven days away from our normal homes in booths, or tents if you like as it is meant to be a temporary dwelling. Like I said, 
Earlier, this was to remind us of the time Yahweh, brought our forefathers out of Egypt, and the time they spent wandering the wilderness. Peter referred to this time as a time of restoration. Acts 3:21, Whom heaven must receive, until the times of restoration of all things, which Yahweh, has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, since the world began, in the New Testament it represents one thousand years of peace, and rebuilding a better, cleaner and caring world. This time of rebuilding is spoken of, in Isaiah 61 verse 4. And they shall rebuild the old ruins, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Yahweh's laws will be written, in the hearts and minds of his people the world over, so that everyone will follow Yahweh. Those that are taken, in the first resurrection will be worthy to be kings and priests in his kingdom for a thousand years. These highly blessed ones, will help rule and restore the world back to its former glory. To be ready for the second resurrection. We can read about this in Revelation 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And shall reign with him, a thousand years. In that time the holy days will still be kept, for these days are forever. The feast of tabernacles will be kept by everyone. Still not all nations will turn to, Yahweh at first. Despite the horror, of the tribulation, there will be a few stubborn nations. But they will change their minds quickly. Zechariah 14 verse 16 to 18. Verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts. And to keep the feast of tabernacles. Verse 17. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, on them. There will be no rain. Verse 18. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations, who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Rest assured, sooner rather than later, all nations will keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Not to mention all the other holy days. The first step is to stop thinking of them as a Jewish thing. Yahweh intended his holy days and laws for all people not just Jews. Wow! One thousand years of peace? Wow, that's something to look forward to. Yes. I can't wait. Well for now, let's get your tent set up. Okay. Shavuot, or as your grandpa says, Shavuos, is the biggest Jewish holiday you've never heard of. And if you have heard of it, great, we don't need to hear about it in the comments. It's one of the three major pilgrimage festivals when Israelites schlep to the temple to give offerings. In the Torah it says to have a holiday seven weeks after Passover, although it's less specific about all the details of what to do on it, apart from offering the first fruits of your wheat harvest, which feels not so relevant. The rabbis long ago picked this day to also celebrate Matan Torah, God giving the Torah to the people at Mount Sinai. A real peak experience. Passover is known for the seders, Sukkot is known for eating in sukkahs, Shavuot, if you know it at all, which you probably don't, is starting to attract some real love for all-nighters called Tikkun Leil Shavuot. These all-night study sessions happen all over the world, and they're a great way to check out the Jewish scene where you live, because you get to have free-form conversations in a less formal setting than services. At some places, tikkun goers keep it traditional, looking at the Book of Ruth to talk about committing to the Jewish people, the wild throne vision from the Book of Ezekiel to talk about Revelation, and of course, the text of the Ten Commandments. Other places bring Torah into hot-button social debates, or bring in the arts and culture crowd with Jewish film screenings, cheese tastings, and yoga at dawn. Not for me, but other people like yoga. The origins are Kabbalistic. It's told that the ancient Israelites overslept when the Torah was given, so we stay awake to show our eagerness to receive the Torah all over again. Receiving the Torah. That phrase. 
It's not just about Moses and the physical Ten Commandments up on Sinai. It's about how we absorb all the Jewish teachings we learn. By the way, receiving Torah doesn't mean the same thing to everyone. Check out these two classic Jewish stories. In one, God uprooted Mount Sinai and held it over the people's heads like a barrel, saying, accept the Torah or else. So they accepted. Some choice. Another says that God went from nation to nation, offering them the Torah, but each of them rejected it until finally the Jewish people said, yeah, okay, na'asev and nishma, we will do, we will listen. This is part of the gist of the phrase chosen people, by the way, of all of the people in the world, the Jews agreed to receive the Torah. Shavuot has other traditions besides the tikkun, like decorating your home with greenery and flowers, because a midrash tells that Mount Sinai suddenly bloomed when the Torah was given. Since this two-day holiday also commemorates the bringing of the first fruits of the harvest to Jerusalem, it's a great time to grab friends for a picnic or a garden party. Here are some key festivals recorded in the Torah. Passover Pesach celebrates the exodus from Egypt marked by the Seder meal and the removal of leavened bread. Feast of Unleavened Bread Chag Hamitzit follows Passover, emphasizing the importance of unleavened bread during the Exodus. Shavuot Feast of Weeks commemorates the giving of the Torah, Mount Sinai, celebrated 50 days after Passover. Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, a time of reflection and repentance. Yom Kippur Day of Atonement, a solemn day of fasting and repentance, focusing on atonement for sins. Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, celebrates the harvest and commemorates the Israelites' time in the wilderness, marked by dwelling in temporary shelters. Shemini Yetzirah, an additional day following Sukkot, a time of solemn assembly and prayer. Simchat Torah, celebrates the conclusion and renewal of the Torah reading cycle. These festivals are integral to the Pentateuch and religious life and are detailed in various books of the Torah, a.k.a. books of Moses, primarily in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Hi, it's Rabbi Mark Fishman here, and I would like to share a thought with you about the holiday of Sukkot. Sukkot is traditionally seen as coming off the back of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. If those days were full of apprehension as to whether we would be judged favorably, the holiday of Sukkot is just the opposite emotion. It's one of joy. We refer to the festival as Yom Simchatinu, meaning the day of our joy. And perhaps the most well-known component to this festival is the law of sitting in a sukkah. A sukkah is a temporary structure that only needs three walls and can be made out of almost anything. Its most important aspect is its ceiling. The roof, or in Hebrew, the schach, must come from something which once grew from the ground, and ideally you should be able to see the stars through it when peering up. Now, fair play to everybody and their religion and their belief systems. My thing is though, if Moses is made up and subsequent events surrounding this character are evidently made up, there's a lot of belief systems that are essentially just made up. And I appreciate everyone's free to do what they want to do. Believe whatever myth they want to believe, whether it's Zeus, whether it's Yahweh, whether it's Elion, whether it's Ares, whether it's Athena, whether it's Horus, whether it's Isis. Everyone's free to do what they want to do. But I don't think people are in a position to tyrannize people over not believing their book of myths that are just based on cosmology and the observances of the heavens as it relates to your harvest, your crops and how you celebrate after you've been gathered your crops. I don't think anyone's in a position to be tyrannical to somebody else for not believing in their book of myth. But let me know what you think. Big up, bless up, think. Sound and logical.